No, the answer, the answer is 600 um, to, get this, to get this picture. And you're probably thinking, like, what is, what is up? So in the uh, June 2000 edition of, of National Geographic, which everybody would inarguably say is a showcase for some of the best photojournalism in the world, the editor of the magazine, uh, uh, Bill Allen, uh, wrote what the average number of photos shot per a National Geographic story was. Any guess? 2,000, 10,000. Any other guesses? Well, if you were shooting film, you'd be broke. In 2000, they were still shooting some, a lot of film. They were not com fully digital in 2000. So the answer is 29,000. So, uh, or for every one picture you saw in the magazine, which in any, mag any one of their stories then, as in today, was about 15 pictures. Um, there was, they shot 1,933 pictures for every one picture you see in the magazine. And so, so the question is, why do I shoot 600 pictures to get that one picture of them dancing? Why do they shoot 29,000 pictures to publish 15? Um, because these are arguably some of the best photographers in the world. We're all pros. We all know what we're doing. So why are we doing that? Um, and the, the answer is, is that we're not looking for good pictures. We're not looking for very good pictures. Uh, we're looking for the very best of the best. We're looking for excellence. Um, and uh, we're not content to shoot a situation and go, that's pretty good. Ten pictures, that was good. I think it's good enough. Um, we're looking for uh, pictures that tell compelling stories. And, uh, a uh, buddy of mine, uh, I was having lunch with him uh, a couple weeks ago and said, oh, I'm going to go to New York and do this presentation. And he said, oh, we're going to talk about it. And I go, well, you know, I'm going to talk about how uh, qu uh, quantity can lead to quality. And his face went blank, and he's like, what? Uh, and I said, you know, you know, like, like how many pictures do you shoot at, a, at a, a pro football game? And he thought for a second, he went, 800. Um, and it's like, well, why do you do that? And it's like, because we're looking for those best, those very, very best of the best. So this is the part of the show where I already showed you some cool pictures, but now it's going to be like the Wizard of Oz moment, and you're going to see the wizard behind the curtain. So I'm going to show you the things that nobody, that people do not show you. Um, come on. Uh, so the first thing is in any time on any assignment that I approach, um, really my primary driver is the part that make, motivates me to take pictures is the challenge of, of finding the way to best visually tell somebody's story. When you're taking pictures, think of yourself as a visual storyteller. And how I like to approach it is, is it's not about me. It's not about the photographer. It's about the story. If you, if you always make decisions on what is best for the story, not what is best for you, in the end, the pictures will be better. Um, so. Uh, the only time uh, that we could work out in our schedules to all meet up to do this picture um, was at noon on a summer day. And the place we decided to meet um, was Gasworks Park, which I thought, fantastic. It's like right on Lake Union. You got a view of the skyline. It'll be cool. Um, but as you can see from the picture, um, it's noon. Noon in a summer day is really one of the worst times from a lighting point of view to take a picture. So there's only one spot in the park where you can get the lake, the people, and the skyline, which I thought, that's going to be the picture. Um, but you can see that she's lit, but still has huge shadows in her eyes, and he's in shadow. And so long as I stayed with my original idea uh, to shoot there, there was never going to be a really great picture, because there's not going to be good light there. Um, so again, if, if I had only been about me, I would have stayed there. But since it's about the story, I had to move. Um, but before we moved, if you've ever seen swing dancing in real life, they, in Lindy Hop especially, they do all these kind of like throws and they, he'll throw her over his head and you know around his back. And, and I thought, that sounds cool. That'll make an awesome picture. So let's, let's see how that turned out. <laughs> well, it looks awesome in person. Um, but uh, when all these... Uh, uh, NX smart cameras uh, shoot eight frames a second, which is fantastic. Really freezes the action. But it turns out Lindy Hop uh, throws, when you freeze them, 
look awkward. Um, so the thing about uh, being a pro is that we're, we're not afraid to make mistakes. You know, it's like, that seems like a good idea, and I try to make that a, a good picture, but if it doesn't work, we're perfectly fine to go, that doesn't work, it, it's, and move on. You know, as opposed to, to go, oh, I'm stuck, I'm done. Um, we're willing to try many, many things to find that one excellent picture. So the part of making mistakes is trying something new, because maybe what the, the new thing you try is going to be the thing that turns out to be the fantastic picture. So I thought, OK, this is terrible lighting. So uh, I'm going to move. We're going to get away from that waterfront location where there's only one angle to shoot where I can never get good lighting. I'm not going to shoot with the long lens anymore. I'm going to put on the I'm going to put on the ultra wide pancake and I'm going to put on the accessory flash so I can do fill flash and fix the lighting. So so that's what I did. Um, but then I went, all right, that was a good it was another good try, but now they don't have their feet in the picture. It is about dancing, right? So it's like a dancing picture better have their feet. Also, if you look in the background there, you see these really big, giant oil refinery looking things. Well, um, Gasworks Park in Seattle is kind of like the uh, High Line here in New York, uh, except that we took an, literally we took an old gas refinery and turned it into a park. But they left all the gas refinery buildings. I don't know, it's a Seattle thing. Um, so still not working for me. The next thing is, is that even with great zoom lenses like the NX has, most people um, forget uh, that the, the zoom lens that they have with them all the time is their feet. Um, uh, most people will shoot, uh, you put, if you put a, a particular lens on a camera, most people will stand the same distance from the subject all the time. You know, there's some like natural space that they find, and that's the way they'll shoot it. Um, but, and they forget that it's like, you have feet. You can move around. It, it's all right. Um, so I backed up a little bit because I thought, too close, not working, got to get farther away. But clearly I didn't move far enough back because, again, it's swing dancing and they swing out, still losing their feet. So part of trying new things, you know, part of what, you know, what, we would, what working photographers would call it is, is working the situation. You know, going through all these iterations is I'm working it. I'm trying to find that really great best picture. Um, so besides most people standing the same distance from their subjects all the time, most people will take all their pictures from this level, eye level. They'll never change their point of view. They always shoot from whatever their eye level is. Most people don't think to change their point of view. Um, you know, uh, I shot mostly with the NX20. And it's the first uh, camera that I've shot that has a swiveling screen, um, and it is fantastic. Um, you know, you can shoot, you can shoot up high, tilt the screen down, and uh, and see above your head and see exactly what you want. Or in this case, I mean, you can see in the foreground of this picture, you can literally see the grass at the foreground because the camera is literally at the is literally at grass height. But I'm not like staining my clothes by lying belly first on the ground. Uh, I've tipped the camera and the screen so I can see it that way. The, um, the NX300 has a tilting screen, um, so you can also do the same thing with that, which is very, very cool. And it tilts both up and down, so both of those are super, super cool. Um, and it really does help open your mind. Having that, those tilting screens or the swiveling screen, it, it reminds you that you have options of viewing the world from a different point of view. Pretty, pretty close. Um, again, uh, like I said, all these cameras will shoot eight frames a second, um, which is really fantastic. The cameras will uh, also shoot in JPEG uh, or RAW or JPEG and RAW uh, at that rate, which is, uh, which is totally amazing. Um, uh, so this picture literally would be impossible without, uh, near to impossible without the eight frames a second. You know, uh, it's, it's just very, very useful. Um, and now it's, it's a pretty successful picture. Uh, you know, you have great action. It really shows the energy of swing dancing, Lindy Hop. Um, color's great. 
it says a lower point of view. It's not as low as the previous picture. Uh, it's really working. But again, it has that weird gas works background. So, but I call this like a safety shot. If you think of it as you're shooting an assignment, at some point you're going to get a picture that's pretty close to being the perfect shot. And if right then you got an emergency cell phone call and had to leave, you'd be good. But once you have that picture and you sort of know it's like, that last picture, that, that could work. It even frees you up even more. Now, now anything you want to try, you can even get more creative than you have been creative because you have something good in the can. So I flipped around. I went to the opposite side of where they were at. And that gets us back to this picture. Um, this picture, I think, is, is, is the most successful because it, it has the blue sky. They both have a really great, joyful expression on their faces. Um, it now has a background that, that says park and not oil refinery. Um, and uh, it shows the real energy of swing dancing. So, you know, I had to shoot 600 pictures. And that's not the last picture. You know, there's, I shot maybe 50, 70 pictures past that. Um, and so that's how you can work it, work the situation until you get a picture that really, really sings. Um, the last trick, of course, is that you only show people this one picture, and you don't show them the 600 other pictures. <laughs> and you don't tell them you took 600 pictures. You just go, yeah, I shot these world-class swing dancers in the park. I really wanted to capture the joy of summer. Here it is. Um, and so that's what you can do, too. So uh, this is a friend of mine who's a, a rock climber. Um, this was shot with the, uh, the, the 16 pancake lens. Um, really wanted to sort of show, you know, out hanging, on the, out hanging on the edge there. And if you look, as we're looking straight out through the picture here, if you went straight out and down, it's, I don't know, 50, 60 feet to the, to the base where the trees are coming from. Um, so the question, and it was just me and him, so I could not rope up and climb up to get to the, his, his height. Um, so the question is, I, but I wanted the picture from that height. Looking up, I, I didn't want to be you know, down looking up at him. I wanted to be like at his level to bring you to the level of what it was like to be the, the rock climber. Um, so again, it's, it's a real simple trick. I took my monopod, and uh, again with the pivoting, the swiveling screen on the NX20, you know, I tilted the screen down, put it on the monopod. Um, where he's climbing is, is a trail that goes up the mountain here. So, he's, so I hiked maybe six or eight feet higher up the trail. And then there was a little ledge that was maybe three feet up that I could stand on that was just, I could stand like one foot in front of the other. So that made me gain about 10 feet on his height. He's maybe 20 feet. 15, 20 feet. So again, it's like an optical illusion. Uh, and then by putting the camera on the end of the monopod, that gets me all the way to his height, and now I can shoot eye level with him. Um, now, one of the cool features of the camera, is, like I said, is these cameras are Wi-Fi enabled. Um, so uh, one of the features of this camera is a remote uh, viewfinder. So you can put it, you can turn the remote viewfinder function on it. So it's, it's an app. You can get it at the the Google App Store. You can get it uh, for your iPhone at the iPhone App Store. Uh, so you, you turn the app on. You can see right through the viewfinder, but here, and fire the shutter when you, when you have your picture. It's very cool. You could use it for this, which is kind of a fun way to use it, or you could use it for your family portrait. You know, you put the camera on a tripod, and you can see exactly the framing. You don't have to run from the camera to get into the picture and shoot the pictures right then. The yeah, you can fire the shutter from the app. It's not just a live view of the. It's not just. A, it is a live view of the shutter, but I mean, it is a live view of what the camera is seeing. But you, you can fire the shutter. Does that work in video mode? Uh, I have. Mode? I'm gonna defer. I've only tried it in still mode. No, is that the answer? No. Yeah, only works in still mode. What's the name of the app? It's just called Remote Viewfinder. So Samsung Remote Viewfinder. Um, so I don't know what, it, what it's like in New York, but Seattle is having this whole circus arts renaissance. Um, it's really, really popular in Seattle. Um, and so I, uh, on one of my assignments, uh, I happened to meet uh, uh, somebody who works in fire arts. 
And so uh, I arranged to go to one of her practices uh, where she does this kind of fire breathing called dragon's breath. So she takes a wand of fire and she puts it into her mouth, takes it out, and then breathes the fire back out. Um, you know what you're shooting, shooting uh, your eyes on? Is that pretty debatable? Uh, yep. I, I thought somebody might ask that, so I made myself a cheat sheet. <laughs> Um, so I shot this with the, uh, the, that, of course, beautiful 85 millimeter lens, which I just love. Um, it was shot at uh, ISO 500, uh, 125th of a second at f7.1. Um, so you can see the, these eight frames here. Again, the, I can't say enough how much having uh, this, this camera having the eight frames a second is invaluable to the work that I do and to, and to making great stories. Um, it was slightly windy on the day that she was practicing, and she practices outdoor for safety reasons. Um, so in a calm day, she can make the fire sustain for many seconds. Uh, but in this particular day, it's one second. So you see the eight frames here. That's how long it lasted. So to get that one really great, I'm going to go back. Uh, storytelling photo here, this one where it captures the really aliveness of the fire, um, I knew that I only had a really short window to do it. In uh, optimal conditions, I would have had seconds to do it. Um, but in this case, I had just the one second, like that. Um, and the color is beautiful. Again, I, I can't talk enough about how, the, how good this CMOS sensor is. Um, it, the color rendering is so great. And again, having that really super fast 85 1.4, um, you know, this is, you know, in this situation, you're going from like pure black, you know, it's practically dark in the, uh, to really bright fire. Um, so it's really great. So as a photojournalist, though, you know, you have to, I went for the fire breathing, but it turns out she was also going to uh, practice fire dancing. Um, so part of, Part of being a good visual storyteller story is not being locked into the one thing that you had in mind before you, uh, before you got there. And so, so then I shot a time exposure. Um, this one was two seconds long. Um, and I cranked it down to 100 ISO. Um, but having shot a few tests, um, the fire was not enough to illuminate her in that time frame. So I put a flash on a remote trigger and fired it a few times while she was moving to sort of accent her, her body there. Uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, again, the, I haven't talked about it so far, but uh, the shutter speeds on these cameras are also great. Um, depends on which camera body that you, you shoot on. Um, I think the NX1000, uh, I think the top one is a 4,000th of a second. Is that right? Um, but the NX20 will go up to an 8,000th of a second. Um, so again, this is like whitewater rafters shooting the rapids, and they're going through a, a place on the on this Snohomish River called Boulder Drop, and they literally like just shoot through there. Uh, and I knew I wanted to to capture that energy of the churning water and all that, so I wanted the as fast a shutter speed as I could get. That's the way you're going to capture the energy and the story of this picture. So this one was shot, I think, at uh, one sixty-four hundredth of a second. Um, question? Is that official housing for that to protect it from the water? No. Uh, this, was, this was shot with the 85, again with the 85, because it's beautiful. Um, uh, and uh, nope, I'm just standing on the river's edge. Um, uh, and I love, what I love about this moment is like, some people are clearly like, oh my god. <laughs> and uh, some people are you know, like smiling like, yeah, let's do it. And I love that sort of range of expression. Um, this one, uh, likewise, seen, they sort of go through a drop and then come out and the water like cascades off the raft. And again, at that high, high shutter speed, uh, again, I think this is about 16400th or 14000th, um, it freezes that water falling off of there and freezes the, all the motion. But you can even go faster. You know, I shot a few pictures, just the water itself, 8,000th of a second. But again, if you're, you're going to be a good storyteller, you have to look for other pictures. 
So hiking down to the river to get to where I could see them shooting the rapids, I came across this little creek, and I thought, no, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so I went the other way. Let me, uh, let me look it up. So the other pictures were shot at a, yeah, 1 hundredth of a second. This one was shot at a third of a second. Um, again, it's about being creative, not locking yourself into telling one story, but leaving yourself open to telling many stories. Again, to talk about the cool Wi-Fi features of the camera, again, this, um, one of the other features, one of the other Wi-Fi features is that uh, once you can connect to a Wi-Fi network, this one does require a network to connect to, um, the cameras uh, can take pictures right from your memory card and you can upload them to the cloud. So as opposed to being the Snohomish River, which is only about an hour and a half from my house, I had been at the Grand Canyon, let's say. Uh, that evening back at the lodge, I could sit there in the lodge lobby with the lodge's Wi-Fi, kick up the camera, connect to SkyDrive, and upload my favorite pictures right from the camera up to my cloud, cloud storage account. Uh, now I know if I drop the camera in the, uh, in the river the next day, my favorite pictures are safely up in the cloud. Um, I could share those folders in the cloud with my family. Um, it's just very cool to be able to go right from the camera to the cloud. The cloud's only gonna become more and more important. Um, to be able to have that in all of these, cam all of these smart cameras is just very, very cool. So good pictures uh, don't uh, happen by accident. Uh, so this is uh, fireworks in the full moon on the 4th of July. Um, it's actually shot at the same, near the same location as the, the uh, swing dancing picture. Um, and I kind of a, you know, amateur astronomy buff. So I saw that on the 4th of July, there was going to be a full moon. And, uh, and that the full moon was coincidentally going to rise at the same time the fireworks show started. Um, so I, I used a little uh, software program that lets you plot um, where, where on the horizon the moon or the sun will rise depending on where you're standing. And so uh, it's, the pictures don't happen by accident. So I, I planned this specific picture. Um, I used this plotting tool to find exactly where I needed to stand on the ground uh, in order to be able to have a chance to get the moon rising and fireworks falling. Is that TPG? Yes, it is. It's TPE. Yeah. It's a great, great tool. Um, if you Google TPE, it's a super great tool. Now, unfortunately, it told me the optim optimal location was going to be staying in the middle of the canal, <laughs> so that did not work. Um, so I stood as close to the edge of the canal as I could. Um, the police would not let me stand on the bridge that goes over the canal for some safety reason. Um, uh, but I got close enough, and this is with the 50 to 200 millimeter lens. Um, and again, having that 20 and having the 20 megapixels really helped um, because I, you know, I had to frame it up, but I needed a little bit of wiggle room because I didn't know exactly where the fireworks were going to go off. I knew where the barge was that they were going to land off of. Uh, and if you've ever shot the moon, the moon is a really tricky thing to shoot um, because the moon um, by itself in the night sky, the moon itself is as bright as daylight. You know, if you think about it, the moon is basically white and it's reflecting the sun. Um, so the exposure for the moon, uh, I shot this at ISO 100 at a 40th of a second at f6.3. Um, very relatively short, you know, daylight-like um, exposure. Um, and just uh, had the camera on a tripod. Uh, cool accessory that would, you know, helps in this is having the remote shutter. There's a, like a remote shutter for the camera that you can plug into the USB connection on the side of the camera. Um, so you're not touching the camera when you're shooting these kind of time exposures. So it's, it's cool to have that. Uh, and I got this picture. You know, you know, how long it's going to be again before there's a 4th of July with a full moon rising? I don't know. But, I, but I've got a fantastic picture because of planning. Um, but I knew I had that picture. And once I had it, again, it's like, I have a fantastic picture. I'm now free to do other things. So this is the same view. Like I said, our, the fireworks in Seattle, they put them on a barge on the, on the Lake Union there and fire them off. So then I did a more traditional um, time exposure. And again, the color looks cool. It's, it's really fun.
Again, I said a uh, bit of an amateur astronomy buff. Uh, in south, uh, southeast Washington on the Columbia River, um, uh, a guy named Sam Hill, uh, ages ago, uh, actually decided to build his own full-scale replica of Stonehenge. Um, what can I say? And uh, and I knew that in the summertime there, you in that part of the Washington, there's not much light, so there's not much light pollution, uh, and then you could get a picture of the Milky Way. Um, so I watched the weather, and you know, again, we didn't have a super clear early summer. Waited for a day when the weather was going to be clear enough, and uh, and ran down to a several hour drive uh, down there. It was a little bit hazy that night, but it was clear enough. Um, and again, but yeah, I sort of planned it in advance. I thought it's going to be cool. You can see Stonehenge cut against the stars. It'll be awesome. Um, but how are you going to see the actual Stonehenge itself? So. I, there's three strobes inside the, inside the structure on a radio remote. Um, and this is a 30 second exposure. Um, and so during the exposure, I fired the strobes off in order to cut the uh, cut Stonehenge out against the background. Uh, and just really, really cool. Where do you aim the strobes? Where in the light? So where are they at in the picture? Yeah. Um, so there's two rings of there's two rings of stones here. So there's w there's one strobe inside the ring on this side. There's one strobe outside the ring on this side shooting back and then there's a second there's a second one farther in pointed the other direction to light that side. So there's two side by side shooting in opposite directions and one on the far side to light the other side. So so what I do cuz there's a lot of rain in, in Seattle is uh, I went to a specialty fabric store that where you can buy uh, Gore-Tex material by the yard. And so I buy some by the yard, and I take a rubber band, and I clip it around the front of the lens like this. It has a view screen in the back, like an old-fashioned camera, and I can hold it up. The camera's now weatherproof. Yep. You know, it's about $5 worth of weatherproof fabric. I'm sure there's some place here where you can find it just as easily. That's that's my solution. And I and even with cameras that say they're weatherproof, there's a lot of rain in Seattle. You know, I'm not going to trust I'm not going to trust the weatherproofing. I trust the Gore-Tex. You know, it works. So, earlier you asked about how did you get this picture without uh, without getting uh, wet without dousing the camera was it in housing? Again, it all goes back to planning. So uh, I went and talked to the river guides, and I, I asked them, again, it's like research. I asked them in advance. I said, I'm looking for a cool shot where you're going through the rapids, but someplace that I can hike to from the shore um, that will get me close. Um, and they said, oh, yeah. They just knew it right off the top of their heads. They, I mean, they were like boulder drop. They're like, it's a, it's a great rapid. Boats go right through it, but there's some big rocks. There's a lot of rocks in this area. And there's some big rocks that stick out from the shore that get you close to where it's at, but they're high enough that you're out of the spray, and you can stand where it's high and dry and shoot the picture. You just have to hike 10 minutes from the road. Very simple. So it looks like I'm in danger of you know, you know, drowning the cameras and having to explain to the folks that send me the camera why it doesn't work anymore. Um, but in fact, I'm perfectly dry, perfectly safe. Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit higher than they are even, you know, from where I'm out on the shore looking down at them. And again, it's just planning. So people ask this me a lot, you know, it's like, how do you ask somebody to take their photo? Like, how do you ask this guy to take his photo? Uh, so this, actually, this picture was actually also taken on the 4th of July. Uh, my wife and I were running downtown to, uh, in, earlier in the day to pick up a desk uh, that we bought off Craigslist. And uh, we're cruising down uh, 2nd Avenue. And I, like, I do this double take, and I'm, I'm like, oh my god, was that like a, a low rider? And, uh, and uh, Peg's like, yes, yes, it is. Um, so we picked up the desk as fast as we could, and we drove around the block and came back and parked because um, it's just like 
It's a beautiful sunny day. It's like this crazy color. Um, we park, and the car's parked there, and there's a bunch of, uh, there's some guys painting a mural, and there's some guys uh, leaning up against a bike rack. And I see this guy, and I go, that's his car. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the guy who owns his car. And, uh, and so I, you know, literally, I, I'm just cold. It's like a cold call. I'm just, I, uh, I haven't said it till now, but one of the great things I love about uh, these cameras um, is that it packs the wall up of a DSLR in this smaller package. Uh, since I've had this camera in my house, uh, if I'm uh, running an errand like this, we were just running an errand, right? But uh, I probably would, well, I know I wouldn't have, I would not have picked up my DSLR to take my DSLR with me on an errand. Um, but I did pick this up because it's small and light, but it has all the quality of my DSLR. Um, and so as I left the house, I picked this up, I threw it on my shoulder, just like this. This is one lens. Um, and I drove by this. Um, and so, I'm going to just go to the next slide. So, so again, how do you ask? I saw this car, and I knew I wanted a picture of this car with the guy who owns that car. Uh, and I saw him walk, I saw the guy sitting up there, and the reason I stopped was it was just cool looking, right? It was this beautiful color, beautiful sunny day. And a lot of, a lot of making good pictures, especially asking people to take their pictures who don't expect you to take their picture, um, is showing genuine interest. You know, I spotted him, I walked up and I went, is that your car? That thing is so cool, right? Uh, I said, it was so cool, we had to drive around the block and come back. Um, and having that genuine interest goes like a long way. Um, you know, if you, you can't feign interest in taking somebody's picture. Um, it will read false they, um, and it won't work. But if you show real genuine interest, that will go like a long way um, to establishing trust with them. And in order to make a, gr a good picture, you have, there has to be some trust between the photographer and the subject especially when you're asking a complete stranger to take their picture. Somebody who's never met you, and uh, you're gonna say, hey, hey, I'm a freelance photojournalist, I'd like to take your picture, I could publish it anywhere. Um, you know, uh, you have to establish trust some way. Did you get them to write to sign a release on I, the spot? I did. Um, I did get them to sign a release on the way. From the camera point of view, again, um, uh, you can see that the color is just fantastic. Um, it's a, the car itself is super vibrant, and the picture, the CMOS sensor is capturing, that large sensor is capturing the vibrancy of that color. Um, truly, truly love it. We have this uh, solstice parade in Seattle, big fair in the middle of summer, celebrating the beginning of summer. Uh, so we know we want to have genuine interest, um, but besides this genuine interest, um, it seems so totally simple, but smile, you know? You're gonna walk up to some complete stranger and ask them to take your picture. The guy who owns the lowrider, uh, this woman is a performer in the parade. She had this cool makeup. Uh, her eyes really popped in the, in the light that morning. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit like asking somebody out on a date, you know? Uh, are you gonna say yes to somebody who's like really serious and kind of frowny and nervous looking? Or are you gonna say yes to somebody who shows genuine interest in smiles, right? You're, most, you're more likely gonna get a yes if you smile. You know, people like people who are nice. You know, it's, it seems simple, and it might seem hard while you're doing it, um, but it's great. Again, uh, uh, I love the Christmas of, again, this was shot with the 85. It's really crisp. Um, can't be bashful. Same thing. It's a little bit about smiling. You have to you have to show confidence. Um, again, are you gonna if you're being all timid, like I'd really like to take your picture, you know that's that's not gonna work. Yeah, that's what I did. I smiled. I uh, and actually I t I uh, I took her picture before I talked to her. Um, a lot of stuff can be done um, uh, non-verbally because it was a crowd of people. The action was was going fast, and I did, wanted to get the picture before the light changed or she moved. Um, and you know, just having the camera, look at them, you know, going, smile, you know, 
making sort of a you know pantomime of what you want to do. It's good if I take your picture, you know, and smiling a little bit. It works. And then I went up and talked to her afterwards. Um, took a few more pictures. Uh, had her sign a release. Um, so it it really it really helps. Do you, um, find, do you find that people question a release? Do they ask about it? Or do that some people do. Um, she was a performer, so she was like used to used to it. Um, it depends on the person. And not and doing all these things, everybody's not always going to say yes. But you'll, the answer will definitely be no if you don't ask. Right? You have a chance of it being yes if you smile and are friendly and are open and have some interest in what they're doing. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought if you're shooting in a public space, in a public area, um, the expectation is as long as you don't sell the photograph, true. that people have no right to have. That's absolutely true. And if I just wanted to publish it as a journalist, um, I wouldn't need the release. But I wanted the option uh, to use the picture more than that, so I asked for the release. If I'd been on assignment um, for uh, the, you know, the American City Business Journal, the Puget Sound Business Journal, who I work for, if it was a business assignment, I wouldn't bother with it. Um, in this case, it was not a direct assignment, so I, I left my options open. Um, it seems funny to say, but uh, acting like a tourist actually will work better for you than uh, trying to sneak the picture. You know, if you're trying to like sneak the picture and be sneaky, um, that's distrustful and that reads to people, as opposed to just being like I'm a I'm a tourist and I'm I'm here on vacation and um, being a tourist and being open and out there actually will work better for you. Either uh, one, it will show that you're not hiding, you're not trying to you're not trying to sneak anything, you're not trying to do anything on the side of sly. Um, and two, people are used to tourists taking pictures, so they also might just ignore you. They might go, I guess this is some tourist. I don't know. Um, so it seems like an odd strategy for, for, for a professional, but it'll work. Um, so this is an assignment I did shoot for the Puget Sound Business Journal, uh, where I work. Uh, and you have to have real confidence in what you're doing. So this is the CEO of a bank, right? Um, and if you're going to photograph CEOs, which I do a lot, um, you have to have confidence. You know, again, just sort of like asking somebody out on a date. You know, you have to the confidence is to walk up to them and say what you feel. Um, and in this case, I have to boss them around, right? I, I have to make a good storytelling picture, and I need them uh, to do what I need them to do to make that picture good. Um, and so I have to be able to go sit in that chair, turn this way, don't put your hand on the table, no, put your hand back on the table. Um, you have to have confidence because, you know, these are people that are uh, used to running the show. And for a few minutes, you're the person who's going to be running the show. Um, so if you're in that situation, you're the director, right? So act like the director. Um, don't, be, don't be afraid to boss people around. Uh, and part of that's knowing your stuff. You know, uh, don't do anything that you're not comfortable with doing. You know, use the features of the camera that you're familiar with. Um, don't, if it's in a situation where you have to present yourself that way, use the things that you, that you know and trust. Um, a cool thing about these cameras, which I haven't talked about so far uh, on the lenses is, uh, and a few people looked at them when we were up front earlier, is these are all eye function lenses, which uh, I don't know if you saw that earlier, but on the side of all these eye function lenses is a little button here, it has an eye on it. And when you click that button, it's, it brings up a quick, it's like a quick key. It's a programmable quick key for the camera. And so I have my eye function uh, programmed to toggle through f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. So without taking my eye away from the camera or the view screen or having to look for the function buttons here, I can just tap the eye function button and be right there at ISO. So I could be in the situation and go, Nope, I need a lower ISO. I don't have to find the ISO menu button. I just tap the eye function button on the side of the lens, tap, tap, ISO, change it, and, and I'm ready to go. It's another sort of cool feature of the Samsung lenses. Again, knowing your stuff and being, uh, being able to have the confidence to boss people around. This is an assignment I shot last week for these uh, their college students who started their own company selling socks with skylines of cities on them. Uh, and uh, they don't, it's a virtual business, they run it out of their, you know, their house. So they said, well, the only place we have product is the warehouse. Uh, so we went to the warehouse, and I'm like, socks, right? Socks. And I'm like, all right, I have to see you in your socks. Take off your shoes and put on different socks. 
uh, and they're like, are you wearing socks? I'm, they're like, yeah. And they're like, well, I want you to, I want to see more than one design. So if you just change your socks, you no, know, it's going to look cool, totally cool. Just to sit here and, I, and I'll do it. And again, you have to build their trust and confidence and smile and, and know that what you're doing is going to make a good picture and convey that what you're in the business of is working together to make an excellent story. And if you do that, people will go along. You do also have to be prepared. So this is the CEO of a tech company in Seattle. We have tons of tech companies. Um, and a lot of times, uh, the CEOs of these companies will give me five minutes, 10 minutes. I might have a half an hour to set up, but I'm only going to have five minutes to take the picture. Um, so you do have to be prepared. Um, you do have to frame your picture up, have your good idea. Maybe you'll get two or three options, but I had five minutes with this guy. Um, and I had to make a good picture of that five minutes. So this was not a situation where I could make 600 pictures. This is a situation where I am going to only make 15 or 20 pictures. Because um, he's just not going to give me that much time. Um, you know, this is a sort of keep me waiting, show up on time, keep me waiting for 25 minutes, give me five. Um, you've heard me talk a lot about storytelling. And uh, sort of one of the founders of modern photojournalism was Henry Cartier-Bresson. Uh, and this is the way that he phrases it. You know, but He's French and very eloquent. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, the way, I, the way I think of storytelling moments and, uh, is that you're looking for that one moment that tells the story better than any other moment. Um, just like the, all, many of these pictures, you know, the fire breather, or whether it's the, uh, the rapids or the dancers, I'm looking for that one moment that tells the story better than any other moment. Uh, and you'll always hear photographers um, talk about that. You know, I came, I got a really great moment at this, at this situation. So this is uh, some friends of mine, uh, kids out in the park, uh, just messing around. And uh, Phil Flash and uh, the older kids are doing sort of Ring Around the Rosy, kind of a regular sort of a picture. Um, but the youngest kid, uh, Evan, what he thought the game was, was not to go around in circles. He thought the game was to go around in a few circles and then crash. Um, and he would do that after about three turns. Um, and this is just like pure joy, um, pure unadulterated childhood joy, because he thought it, that was the game. The game was to fly around and, and then flop onto the ground. And capturing that kind of moment is, is what is great. And uh, shooting with this camera, I have been able to capture many of those kinds of moments. Like this one we've seen before. This one. Or this one. This is the, uh, going to the, going to the mid, whoops, I go back. Let's go back to this one. Uh, it's a story about midwives that I shot a couple weeks ago. And this is their first visit, uh, and this exact moment is when they're hearing the baby's heartbeat for the first time. Um, the thing about moments like this is that um, it trumps everything else you can do in photography. If you can capture a moment like this, um, everything else is just gravy. Uh, and th these are the kind of things that you're looking for. Or this. This is my nephew. Um, and again, having that, this that was, this is with the 85. Um, you never know when a great picture is going to happen. And having uh, this camera that's so easy to carry but has packed so much quality into that, into that small form factor, you can get moments like this. But again, it's Wi-Fi enabled. So what's cool is I can take that picture of my nephew um, and then with the Wi-Fi network at the ice cream shop or the Starbucks, uh, I can share right from the camera in just a few clicks. I can send the picture to Facebook or Picasa or uh, if it was a movie, I can send it to YouTube. And in this sort of connected world where people are used to using their smartphones and sharing pictures right away, um, it's cool that you can do it from, from a camera like this. Uh, the advantage is, is that you, know, you can't shoot, uh, I'm going to back up here. Let's see. We'll go forward again. You can't shoot with the 8514 on your smartphone. 
you can't have that beautiful lens and that beautiful uh, narrowed up the field look. Um, but here you can. And it's not just that. Maybe, you, maybe I don't want to post it to Facebook and send it to everybody I know. Maybe I just want to take that one picture of my nephew and send it to my sister. And so likewise, you can email. Uh, you can select the picture or two that you want to, and you can email right from the camera right to who you want to send it to, um, which again is just very, very cool. So uh, again, it's a great storytelling moment, but it also, remember, a part of this picture was that I moved to get better light. Uh, so this is a 787 that everybody knows now. <laughs> <laughs> They make them in Seattle. <laughs> so this was, uh, this was the first 787 flight uh, nonstop from Japan to SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And uh, SeaTac has this tradition. I don't know if they have it out here. But in, in Seattle, at SeaTac, whenever there's like a new thing at the airport, a new airline route or a new airline or new service, new airplane, um, they do this like water turret ceremony where they bring the fire trucks out and they shoot two gigantic streams of water. They make this big arch of water. And then they drive the plane underneath it. And the PR guy who had, and this was in fall last year, in the morning, in fall. And the PR guy who works at the, at the airport, he's been working there for like 10 years. And in 10 years of uh, shooting water over airplanes, uh, the, the light had never been the right angle to make a rainbow. Um, but that day, the, with the sort of late winter, early, I mean the late fall, early winter light, um, and the mist from the water turrets, um, beautiful bright day, blue sky, and then rainbow, like magic. Um, and a lot of great pictures um, need great light, or great light can help you make a great picture. Uh, and it could be a simple thing, it could be a bald eagle, um, this is with, this is with the two hundred, the fifty to two hundred millimeter lens. This is a two hundred millimeter shot. Um, just outstanding, you know. Again, the fifty to two hundred millimeter. Uh, this is a near our house on on Puget Sound. Uh, it's a low tide, and herons go out there and hunt for fish. Um, and again, it had beautiful morning light. It makes the pictures just pop. River otter. <laughs> Likewise, this is with the eighty, the eighty-five, which I, you can't tell. I love that lens. So I shot this in in Central Park um, a couple days ago, or I guess yesterday. My jet lag, sorry. Um, and you're thinking, like, what is he showing this for? And it's like this is like totally mundane. Like, what's the what's the story? Um, is to illustrate how. The black and the white. No, no, they're not at all. It's very, very black. And snow. It is very black and it is very white. But really, what it's to illustrate is that this picture was taken when it was cloudy. This picture was taken when it was sunny. Um, so great light can take something that seems completely mundane, and turn it into something that's cool. You know, you're probably not going to show this picture to your friends. You're not going to go, hey, I was walking through the park and I saw this really cool thing. It was snow. <laughs> and people had been walking through it. It was kind of ugly. <laughs> right? But this, you're going to go, hey, I was at the park and there was these really great shadows. And so pro photographers, what they're looking for is great light. You know. This is a story I shot for the Business Journal. <laughs> Uh, about a guy who wants to build a hotel right across from the Space Needle. This was a beautiful blue sky day in Seattle. But the hotel is by another building in shadow. And you really want the, you really want the Space Needle to be bright and crisp. So what are you going to do about that? Um, it seems weird, but one of the best uses for, flash, for flash is the daytime. So especially if you use the accessory flash like this, that packs a little more, a little more punch, uh, especially when you have something as bright as that. But having this accessory flash can turn, you know, that picture into this picture. Um, and it seems weird. People don't think of flash and daylight, but often flash and daylight 
go together. And having the accessory flash like this really makes a difference. So this was during the summer. This is uh, actually my uh, ukulele teacher. Um, and uh, because of forest fires we were having, there were all these beautiful sunsets. <laughs> really, really beautiful, beautiful sunsets. Um, and he lives right by the beach there. And so I wanted to capture that sort of island feel, going to the beach, beautiful sunset. Um, except that, you know, I'm looking right at the sun, even with the, even with the forest fire smoke to make it more orange. Beautiful color. You know, again, I, I love the color in these pictures. But you need, if I just took the picture and balanced it for the sun, he'd be in shadow. There'd be no picture. Um, but by using that accessory flash on the camera, I'm able, able to pop him with a little flash, and, and now I have him beautifully lit and, and the sunset. So it seems weird, you gotta, but you have to think about uh, that flash is, can be a daylight tool. And anytime you see a sunset, most people, if they see a sunset, they see the, all that beautiful color, they look at the sunset, and that's all they look at. But if you think about it, all that beautiful light is shining on something. So turn your back to the sunset and look the other direction, and you'll see that the clouds looking the other way have all that, all that beautiful color. So I shot first him against the, sky, against the sky itself, I mean against the sun itself, and then turn him around the other way. I'm still using the accessory flash here, because again, the clouds are so bright, I want to balance him against the clouds. And one of the cool features of the camera is that you can go into the menus of the camera and you can control the flash intensity, um, which is like a really, really great tool that most people never use. Um, the cameras are very good at guesstimating how much flash to use, um, but you can like finesse it so that it, it looks balanced. So it doesn't look like you took a flash picture, so it looks like the balance of the light coming from the flash balances the light in the sky. And just click into the menu, go to fill flash function, and you can turn the flash up and down uh, two full stops, which is which is a really really cool feature that most people never use. And you can use this with the built-in flash on the NX20. You can use it on the accessory flash, on the on the uh, 210 and the 1000. It also has an accessory flash and the same thing. You can in all of them you can go into the menu and control the fill flash. It's super cool. So uh, this is me uh, in Seattle. Um, we have a lot of hills in Seattle um, with my lighting kit um, uh, and. Just to show you that if an assignment is within about three quarters of a mile from my office, um, I will walk to it. And so uh, I like to travel light and carry uh, a light amount of gear, uh, which with this gear really helps me out, uh, and a, a small number of uh, flash gear. So all the flashes, all the cameras are in the camera bag, uh, radio remotes, and then in the small bag on my shoulder is the light stands. So a very lightweight kit. So with that kit, I took this picture. This is um, shot with a 16 millimeter pancake lens. Um, uh, again, on the NX20, uh, it has that. It's a, we have a lot of, do you have all these micro craft distilleries here? There's like a huge trend in Seattle of uh, micro craft distilleries that will do small batch like uh, vodka and whiskey and all that kind of gin. Um, so this is a small batch um, distillery called Glass Distillery. Um, and they just have this beautiful, beautiful copper pear-shaped um, kettle. Uh, and I just really wanted to show the beauty of it. I wanted to capture that vibrant, vibrant color, which the camera is great at. Um, again, I used, I can't say enough about the, the tilting and swivel lenses on these cameras, how they can change your point of view. Um, I took this picture. And I stood up on a catwalk, and then I used, again, my monopod. I, again, put the camera on the end of my monopod so I could frame it up and look down so that the camera is about the same height as the top of the kettle. Um, and then I showed the picture to him afterwards, and he was like, oh my god, that's so beautiful. And he's had a lot of professional photographers into his space. And he said, how did you possibly think of that angle? Nobody had ever shot that angle before. Um, and part of it's the cameras themselves uh, make make me think in a different sort of creative way. Um, so there's three lights to light this. There's a softbox, and I, and I travel with the very smallest softbox I can. 
Um, one, it helps me fit into really tight situations. And two, it's less intimidating for the people. So it's only a softbox. It's only about this big. Um, so there's a softbox lighting the side of the kettle and him. There's uh, just a bare strobe uh, in front of and to the right lighting this part of the columns. And then there's another strobe that's hidden behind that center column that's lighting the other side of the big pear-shaped kettle. So with those three simple lights and some radio strobes, um, I'm able to make this beautiful, vibrant picture. This is the bottling line. Um, they use these beautiful, beautiful sort of uh, crystal glass uh, uh, decanter-like uh, bottles for the glass, for the, for the distillery. And I just really loved how the light refracted through the glass. Again, love the color. Love the Christmas of the 85. And I just played around. This is with the 60 macro. I saw how things uh, reflected through the, the glass. I thought, oh, that's a cool shot. So the question is, why did I light it? And that's because it's an industrial space. And this is what it looks like with the, the bare lighting there. I had seen the bottles out in the showroom by the windows and saw how they really glistened and, and, and how they made a really great color and all that. But in this lighting, it's going to look terrible. But with the strobes, it looks like that. So you can see where the three strobes are. There's a soft box to light her face. There's a, a light behind to, to light the bottles on the counter. And then there's a light down low that shines through the bottles. And it's that, it's that strobe that's lighting through the bottles that is making this gorgeous light on her face. Because the light is bouncing through all the, all the glass and vodka and making this sort of luminous, luminous light. Um, and it just turns out fabulous. Again, sound like a broken record, but uh, uh, the color, uh, this is one of the early pictures I took on the camera, and the color uh, off of these uh, CMOS sensors is just astounding. Again, like I said, uh, circus arts is a really big deal in Seattle right now, uh, including a lot of aerialists. Uh, so this is a silks um, performer, um, and I just really love the color of the silks uh, and the sort of... Uh, beauty of it. This is like a really industrial space, but the silks make it beautiful. To get this picture, it's four lights. Um, one to, in the front to light her. There's one behind which I gelled. It's really great to get a gel sample kit, because a gel sample kit is like a little swatch book of gel colors, and they perfectly fit on the front of this accessory flash. Um, so you can just get the little sample book, like a Roscoe light, and it costs a few bucks. You buy it, and you have all these colors. You can just tape them right in the front with some masking tape uh, or scotch tape. Uh, so one in the back, because it had a little circus feel. One down below to make all those shadows on the, on the silks. And then one behind, because there's two layers of silks to light them both. Sim so all this I could carry on my back. Again, great pictures can be about great light. So when you see great light, you have to be open to making it and seeing what you can make out of it. So I walked into this club, and they have these weird, giant, lighted cubes that are like lit with LEDs. And I thought, that's a cool picture. And I had a filmmaker that I wanted to take a picture of. And I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. Red, green, blue, shooting video. Kind of talks about the nature of you know, the sort of the primary colors of making a picture. So I used those interesting light cubes, one strobe with a snoot, uh, to make this picture. In Seattle, we have this uh, famous, one of the top chefs in Seattle is uh, Tom Douglas. You might have seen him on Top Chef as a guest judge this last season. Um, and he credits his business in existence to uh, this coconut, triple coconut cream pie. So I was doing a story about him being uh, executive of the year, so I had to take pictures of this coconut cream pie. So, you know, they make these at like 5 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. So it's one soft box. I'll show it here. And one st strobe behind. 
really simple lighting. You know, they're just perpendicular. I'm looking this way, the two lights are going that way. Beautiful light, beautiful lens, beautiful picture. So I'm gonna click through these food pictures. We're also shot for the story. And get to the video. So these cameras also shoot full HD video, which is very cool. Um, using the H.264 codec, which is, which is great. You get, a, you get full HD without totally eating up all the space on your uh, SD cards. Um, but you can shoot in multiple, you can shoot in multiple file sizes. Um, for my money, uh, when I'm shooting stills, I shoot at the full 20 megapixels. And when I'm shooting video, I shoot at the full uh, 1080 uh, HD. You have choices of exposure control. You can use it in program, after priority, shutter priority, or manual. So whatever creatively you're comfortable with. Um, one of the cool features that I like is that uh, right built into the camera, it can do uh, stop motion. So which they in the menu is called uh, multi motion. So you can shoot, uh, so you can shoot a little stop motion like this, right in the camera, which is which is very very cool. Uh, just to be able to with a few flicks of the. Uh, of the menus to be able to shoot something like this is uh, it's a pretty awesome creative uh, built-in creative tool. Um, just some general tips about shooting video. Um, nobody really likes shaky video. Some people like it stylistically, but uh, the truth is most normal people don't like it. Just shake your head like back and forth for like three seconds and try to see anything. You know, most people don't like it. Um, so I always try to I always try to tell people. Uh, you know, if you first choice, put your camera on a tripod. Second choice, put your camera on a monopod. <laughs> Third choice, use good technique. Um, so many people are used to using their smartphones uh, to shoot pictures and the screens in the back of cameras that people shoot like this, really, really far out. But the farther you put your arms out from your body, the harder it is to hold the camera steady. So just bring your arms back against your body. So if you just bring your arms a little bit, now it's more like a tripod. Also, put the camera in the base of your hand. You know, use good, use good technique. And especially with the, if you've got the movie lens on there, it's about the same length. Um, it's a nice platform. Put your hand right on the lens, grip the, the grip. And, uh, and all these NX cameras have a, a really nice ergonomic feel. They fit right into your hand really well. So you have a good base to hold the camera. So there, body against the camera, and now you have a much steadier base. Um, come on. Um, let's see. Do we have the audio? Okay. So this is a this is something I shot. Uh, most of this was actually shot on the NX. Uh, 210, so uh, so on this camera here. Um, a little of it was shot on the NX20, but here's just a little a little clip that I I shot. So <clears throat> most of that was shot with the movie lens. Again, that cool 18 to 200 millimeter lens. Uh, so how did I build that as a story? So first off, uh, this is my nephew. So uh, first off, it's about they have this cool thing where the kids can feed the, feed the penguins at the zoo. Um, so that's the sort of the heart of the story. So that's the first two shots of the story. Uh, and I knew I wanted to have a cutaway. I just didn't want to see it from one angle. So it did take a little planning again. 
Again, those same tools that I use for stills, I can use in video. So he gets to feed four fish. So I shot two fish from this side, zoomed in at 200 millimeters, watched him go one, two, and then in between one and two, I ran around to the back side to look over his shoulder and now shot with the 18 of him feeding the other two fish. So that's what we're going to call the heart of the story. Uh, next, I wanted to show a little bit of place and show it's the, make sure you know it's like a kid in a big place and there's these, all this underwater glass so that the kids can look through the glass at their own kid level uh, and see the penguins swimming around. So I shot these sort of medium shots. Um, again, zoomed out. Nope, I ha I, in this case, uh, I, ha I did hand holding the whole time. And again, I just used that good technique. Um, now, you might want to use a monopod. Um, they probably won't let you use a tripod at the zoo. Um, but uh, I've done it for 25 years, so I'm practiced. Then I wanted some sort of medium shots, you know, some other shots of him interacting with the, all the glass. So him, you know, ch or having the penguins chase him, him looking through the big glass bubble. And then he did this whole swimming underwater thing, which was totally unexpected, but was so cute that it was like, that was just like gravy. I'm like, yes. Um, so, you know, in any story about people, that's, that's where you want. You're starting with those, those shots. I wanted the little, you know, the, the little shot of penguins are cool, right? So we have that. And then just for aesthetic reasons, I decided and pacing for the little video, because I didn't want it to be more than a minute long. Um, I inset that into this other shot. So from here, this is where a lot of people don't think of. Most people think of these shots. They have their camera out there, they're catching the cool HD video, they're getting the stereo sound. Um, I didn't mention it yet, but um, there's also an accessory microphone for the uh, NX cameras. So you can, this just slides right onto the hot shoe mount and interfaces with it. And it's cool, it has a, uh, it has a headphone jack built right into the side. So you can listen to the audio that's being recorded to the camera, which is pretty cool. And it has a little wide and telephoto switch. So depending on which way you're shooting, you can change the, uh, the way the microphone listens to the sound, which is cool. And this is what most people would think of. It's my kid at the zoo. That's the story. But what really makes a good video is B-roll. It's all the other things around the main heart of the story that let you have something to cut to to tell the story. So the first thing I like to have in the B-roll category is something that sets the place. And so in this case, a wide shot that shows the whole big tank of the, of the zoo. Then these cutaway shots that visually tell you it's about feeding the penguin and we're going to feed them anchovies. Then an actual shot of the little fish. I always like to think of, is there a shot that is a natural beginning? So I shot all these pictures. So I shot a ton of video footage of the penguin swinging around and jumping, getting in the water, getting out of the water. And it's like, ah, yes, they jump into the water. That's a natural beginning. We're on the shore. We're going in. Which then transitions really nice to this low torpedo shot where it goes across, across the tank. And then I wanted some fun shots of them. They're just like really cute and they come up to the glass and, and mess around with people. So several of those shots, because they're nice like cutaways that add kind of to the humor and the fun of it. So several of those. And then are you looking for a natural end to a video? You want a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? So then the penguin's walking out. Now you have a complete story. Uh, and all I did really was I shot the heart of the story, which is him interacting with the penguins. And then I shot, it's like, you can't make a story just out of that. It, or you can't make a really good story out of it. So it's a lot of shooting video is thinking about the small side things. Because those are the things that let you clip the story together to make a whole story. And what's again cool about these cameras? These cameras have built-in Wi-Fi. So any place you can get a Wi-Fi network, you can use the, the Wi-Fi in the camera to share this on YouTube. There is a restriction, though. You have to have shot the video uh, in uh, sharing mode, so which is a lot lower resolution. And you can only shoot a 30-second clip. Um, 
correct? Any uh, naysayers on that? Uh, and so in this situation, I shot it in HD. But if I'd wanted to share a little clip with my, my sister who wasn't there, uh, I would just quickly change it down to sharing, shoot 30 seconds of him messing around, switch back to HD. This is another little video I shot. So again, this was shot in the full HD. Um, all the same techniques we talked about with stills work for video. Uh, and so again, trying something new. I'm going to go through these a little quickly here. Uh, so don't shoot it all from the same angle. Don't just stand in one spot, use the same lens the whole time. Uh, just like, in, just like we were doing with the stills, change your point of view if you can. So I just didn't shoot from the front. I went around to the other side where I could see the crowd behind. One side facing the building, one side facing the other way. Again, that movie zoom, 18 to 200 millimeters, is a great one to use. Think about shooting high and low. Uh, I did shoot this one on a monopod, and I did uh, use the tilting screen to shoot, held it up way over my head to get this shot where I could see more of the crowd that way. Again, it's all about B-roll. It's all about having these cutaway shots. It, again, like he was talking to, without the cutaway, you can't, switch, you can't switch the point of view. But since I have all these cutaways, I can. Besides cutaways, it's, it's great to have reactions. So not just details of the fireworks and the dragons and all that. It's great to see people's reactions so that the lion dances towards them, and then, the, and then you get the reaction of the joy or the shock. And as I said before, the audio. So not only did I stand there and record a minute of the audio, I shot some video of the audio so that you know where the audio is coming from. And just like before, if we shoot it in sharing mode, we can share right from the scene using the Wi-Fi at the museum to share a little bit of this lion dance. But again, one of the coolest features of the camera is the Wi-Fi smart camera features. We've already talked about three of them as we've gone along, the remote viewfinder. So that cool function where you can use your smartphone to actually see through the viewfinder of the camera and, and actually fire the shutter, take pictures. Email, you know, that we can, again, use the Wi-Fi to take a picture of my nephew eating ice cream and email it to my sister. The cloud storage, we can be out on our, that vacation to Paris or the Grand Canyon and save our pictures right up to the cloud. The social sharing, so either where we shoot that video and that web sharing video and shoot that little bit of the lion dance and go, this is where I am right now, uh, or the uh, sharing it to Facebook. And in the Facebook pictures, you can, you can shoot in the full 20 mega, megapixel um, resolution of the camera. And when you send it to Facebook, the camera automatically downsamples the picture and sends a lower resolution version uh, to, to Facebook. So a few other features that, that the camera has that is pretty cool is mobile link. So mobile link lets you link your smartphone or your tablet. So a tablet like you know the, the Samsung Note uh, lets you link the camera to the tablet, and you can share the pictures across. So you can establish a, a Wi-Fi direct link 
and pull pictures from the camera to your smartphone or your tablet. Very cool. That's also an app online. Yeah, it's an app online. So you can get it at the, at the Google App Store or the uh, iPhone App Store. This one, I think, is like genius. Um, how many people in this room diligently back up all of their pictures once they've taken them? Wow, okay, you're a really good crowd. <laughs> Most of the time I ask that question, it's like two or three like very shaky hands. And I, I know at least in my family, even though I'm a professional photographer, I know my mom and uh, my mom and dad and my sisters do not do it. Most of the time, sometime when I'm over at my mom's house, I take her camera surreptitiously and back up all of her pictures for her and then put the memory cards back in. But with this, you can uh, load some software onto your computer and you can do an auto backup where you can, again, with that Wi-Fi direct, you don't need an establishing Wi-Fi network, you can back up all the pictures from the camera to your computer, which is fantastic because most people are really bad at this. And I think this is a really important feature because there are so many times where I've heard people who have lost their camera, something happens to a memory card. So it's a really, really cool feature. If you have a... Uh, Samsung TV, people you know, like to share pictures. You can also use the Wi-Fi wi -Fi Direct to again show the, do a slideshow directly from the camera to the TV. So you got your friends over, you just came back from vacation, you can just show them right from the camera right onto the TV. And as they've been talking, uh, all of this is possible because it's Wi-Fi Direct. Um, so it's the camera communicating directly with your smartphone, directly with your tablet, directly with your computer directly with your TV. Thank you. Yep. Certainly. And sort of lastly, don't forget the basics. Um, if you're going to go on that once in a lifetime trip to the Grand Canyon or Paris or Hawaii, wherever you're going to go, um, make sure to bring extra memory cards and extra batteries. It, it doesn't do you any good to go on a once in a lifetime trip and have 20 megapixels and fantastic glass at your disposal and run out of and run out of batteries because you've been shooting pictures constantly for like you know hours straight um, get spend just a few extra bucks and buy some extra batteries um, you'll you'll really uh, it'll be really be worth it likewise you don't want to be on that vacation and run out of memory uh, so get some extra memory cards as well and I'd like to thank B&H again for having, having me out and uh, Samsung for bringing me out here to talk to you today about the cameras. Uh, I truly, truly love them. Uh, if you want to learn more about the cameras, you can go to samsung.com slash nx. Um, and if you, wanna, if, you wanna, if you have questions that you think of later and you want to contact me and I can help you get the answer for them, just go to my website, marcusdonner.com. There's a little contact form there. And I'll be happy to answer your questions for as long as you have them. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.